Hello. Hey. hey. Um, cool. Welcome everyone to the second episode of IBC Explain to Cosmonauts. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen now so we can go through the slides. All right. Um, so again, this is episode two. Um, in this episode, we're going to be focusing mostly on um, Ethermint. So the first part, I will again walk through quickly how IBC and Raylayers work for those who didn't have a chance to see the last episode um, and how to get started with IBC transfers and specifically the concept of channel IDs, which is confusing, uh, which can be confusing. So just to kind of get into how that works and what's going on under the hood. Um, but first, a little introduction. I am, uh, my name is Charlie. I'm currently working at the Interchain Foundation um, as the IBC product lead. I joined the Cosmos ecosystem fairly recently in March, um, but since then it's been a pretty quick ride or a pretty wild ride. <laughs> and um, as March coincided with the launch of IBC, it's also been really exciting to be here at this, uh, in this space at the moment. Um, yeah, and I'll pass it on to Fede. Hey. Hey everyone, I'm Federico. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tharsis, which is a company that we're focusing on all things EVM and interoperability on Cosmos. We're the core team that it's maintaining and pushing the innovation uh, on EVM interoperability, and especially on IVC and how we can use Ethermint to connect different chains within the Cosmos ecosystem and different EVMs outside the Cosmos ecosystem. So excited to be here and thanks Charlie for having me on this episode. Uh, yeah. Cool, and thanks again Omniflex and um, AIB for helping to support this. Okay, so the quick rundown into what's going on under the hood in IBC. Um, so as you can see here, this is Map of Zones, which is the IBC Explorer, um, which you can find live also. Um, what you can see is Map of Zones displaying the number of uh, active zones at the moment. And um, this one is actually a little bit old. Um, this image is from a few weeks ago. Um, so the number that you see if you go on Map of Zones right now might not be exactly this number. But you can see that there are nine active zones. And between the zones, you can see the multiple connections. Um, on the right, you can see all channels. There's 204 channels. And we'll go into what a channel is a little bit later on. Um, but basically, each, yeah, each zone is connected um, through IBC. And that's how um, messages and assets and tokens, et cetera, are passed across. So all of this. IBC layer on top is supported underneath by something called a relayer infrastructure. And this is important to understand because some of you may or may not have experienced transaction taking a little bit longer than you thought that they might take. Um, this is not due to your funds disappearing or your funds getting stuck somewhere, you know, in, in the chaos. It's actually 99.9% .9 of the time, unless it's a wrong address or something like this. Um, happening because the relayer infrastructure has not picked up the transaction yet. So I'll go into a little bit of detail of what that means. Um, using a token transfer as an example, um, you can see, okay, let's say this is a token transfer between zone A and zone B. What happens when zone A or a user on zone A wants to transfer tokens to zone B is that the tokens are first locked up on zone A in an escrow contract. Um, this is represented by the first image and the little lock there. In the second image, you can see a small piece of paper being passed across to zone B. This is representing a proof. So basically, the transaction is submitted saying, okay, I want to, I want to mint or to transfer my tokens onto zone B. The tokens are locked up on zone A, a proof of that lockup and is passed along to zone B. And this person who is passing along or this infrastructure which is passing along that proof is called the relayer. And so relayers, you can think of them as the logistics providers of the network. If IBC is a shipping container, which is standardized, which has certain dimensions, which carries all of the different assets that you want to transfer, then relayers are these logistic providers, the, the shipping companies, the boats which are carrying these uh, messages back and forth. And so the relayer is going to carry the proof over to zone B that the tokens are indeed 
on Zone A and that they have been locked up. Then when Zone B receives that proof, it's able to know, okay, now I can mint the corresponding assets on Zone B. So what that looks like in your wallet, um, I'll give two examples. The first one is with Kepler. Um, you select the chain that you wanna transfer from, and then you select uh, a transfer channel. So on, on Kepler, the channel is something that you have to type in. And this is might be a bit confusing because you might be wondering, okay, how do I find out which channel I need to go to or which channel should I send through? Channels are basically paths that are established between two different chains with IBC. It's used to trace um, the path that the token has taken. And so there are very specific channels that you need to, to access in order to make an IB transfer, IBC transfer. And the reason for that is that you can imagine it as a token taking a specific route uh, from one chain to another. That token, if it's passed through a specific route, is going to have a certain um, set of security guarantees or a certain set of security assumptions that says, okay, I've passed through this route and therefore, you know, I've, I've uh, gone through the security of this route. If it goes through another route, or in this case, another channel, it's going to have a different set of security assumptions. And so IBC, because it's designed for a very adversarial environment where, you know, contrary to chains like Ethereum or like Polkadot, where there's shared security, where you're relying on a centralized beacon or relay chain to let you know uh, which validators to trust or which shards to communicate to, IBC doesn't make any of those assumptions. And so while that's really powerful and flexible and allows us to interact in every single type of environment possible without relying on a centralized controller. It also means that we need to make sure that every token that we're getting is traveling down the same path and therefore going through the same security assumptions. And so that's why channels are really important. And so how do you find the right channel ID to go through so that you can make sure that your token is fungible when it gets to the other side? The most easy way um, is currently is to go onto Map of Zones. If you hover your mouse over one of the hub icons, um, for some browsers, like I've experienced some issues with Brave, for example, where it doesn't immediately show up, but for Firefox, it, it works every time. Um, you'll hover over this uh, button and then you'll see, or the, the hub icon, and you'll see a details um, uh, area. When you go into details, you'll see, okay, if, if I wanna transfer from Cosmos Hub to Osmosis, I should use channel 141. Um, Again, it's important to note that the channel ID is extremely important to get correct. The other thing is that the channel ID will change if depending on your source chain. So for example, I mean, it makes sense if you think about it as a path, you know? So path number 141 is the channel from Cosmos to Osmosis. But if I'm transferring from Osmosis to Cosmos, it'll be a different channel. I believe it's channel zero from Osmosis to Cosmos. So again, extremely important to take note of. Um, that is one way that your funds will not be lost forever, but they could be a little bit more complex to retrieve if you send it down the wrong channel. Um, so after you've selected your channel ID uh, in, in Kepler, then you can select your destination chain, recipient address on the destination, maybe a little memo, um, how many atoms you wanna transfer, and then, uh, and then approve the transfer. So with Rainbow Wallet, it's a very similar UI, UI um, the, or UX. The kind of main difference, I think, is that they pre-select your channels for you. So you, you don't have to manually type in your channel ID. But again, it's very similar steps. Select the channel, select the destination chain, the amounts, and then confirm. One thing I want to note is that if you go onto MintScan, you can actually see these transactions happening. Uh, all the transactions titled by pre prefix with IBC are, yeah, the IBC transactions. So obviously, MintScan will display the latest transactions unless you have the transaction hash. You can search specifically. But if you see the latest transactions, you might be able to see your transaction popping up as well. Um, and now I'll pass the mic over to Fede, who's going to give you a little bit of, of uh, under oversight on uh, what's happening with Ethermint these days. We know that Ethermint's been in development for a long time, but this is a really exciting time for Ethermint as it's about to launch very soon. And uh, Fede will let you know what that looks like. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that was a really good recap of what we're doing. And thanks for the useful tutorial of how to use IVC transfers. 
on defining some complex um, UX terms, especially like for channel and IVC transfers, which is really re relevant for having to properly have your funds properly transfer over IVC. Um, yeah, so quick, quick recap, I'm Federico. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Tharsis. Uh, Tharsis is a um, development company that's focusing on launching Ethermint. Ethermint is the first EVM chain that is gonna run on Cosmos. Um, so we've been work, it has been a long-standing project uh, since, so since 2016. Um, it began as a um, project that was more in like the research area of how could we deploy an EVM on top of Tendermint Core, which is a consensus um, layer that all the Cosmos chain use that handles all the networking and, um, and uh, gossiping and um, all the consensus layer for all the different Cosmos chains. Um, so it started like that and then it slowly migrated into like a full blown Cosmos chain that uses an, I, an EVM module as its core piece, uh, as its centerpiece, so that um, users can deploy their smart contracts written in Solidity or in Viper uh, in the same way that they would do on Ethereum. Um, plus having the benefit of being a full proof of stake uh, chain that uses uh, the Tendermint consensus with fast finality and of course um, full interoperability uh, thanks to IVC. Um, so that's kind of like the quick recap of what Ethermint does and how and we as Tharsis are going like our plan is to expand all the possibilities of how to interact with EVM chains but not only um, from like uh, native Cosmos chains, but all the chains that support IVC and also with mainnet Ethereum and other VM chains that are that might be outside of the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I will explain a bit what the capabilities are and what uh, Ethermint is uh, at a high level. Um, yeah, so here's a list of, list of features. Um, so here on the right, you can see um, kind of like a small visualization of how the EVM component or like the Ethermint chain is constructed. So we have a, like as core it uses, it uses Tendermint as a consensus mechanism and the consensus engine. Uh, and then we have all the SDK modules that are in blue, the governance taking IVC and distribution, which it covers rewards and fees. Um, and we also have the EVM module, which is the modules that handles like the um, state transitions for smart contracts to be executed and created as well. And then we have a Web3 layer, which is, is just like the JSON RPC service that is able to communicate with um, all the Ethereum, uh, the existing Ethereum tooling like MetaMask, Truffle, Hardhat. So developers that are already familiar with Ethereum can expect the same user experience that are that they're already familiar with. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of like the in general like the infrastructure or like the the, the architecture of the of the chain. Um, we're expanding some of these capabilities by adding additional like IVC application uh, modules that were, as I mentioned before, able to expand what it's currently out there um, with regards to like expanding tokens transfer, not only between Cosmos chains uh, using standard Cosmos coins like the Atom, but also being able to transfer value using ERC-20 token uh, standard um, for ERC-20 tokens that are deployed within uh, Ethermint's EVM. So, uh, yeah, can, can you go back uh, one second? I wanna cover a little bit things, more things. Yeah, so um, through IVC, um, Ethermint is horizontal, horizontally scalable, um, as well as like um, the use of the gravity bridge. We plan to integrate also a bridge to be able to communicate directly with Ethereum. Um, so then we can also access to liquidity sources from Ethereum and other EVM chains, and also from other chains within the Cosmos ecosystem, like the Cosmos Hub, Region, Osmosis, 
etc. Uh, through IVC in the same fashion that um, Charlie mentioned now and you um, that show on the tutorial. Um, so users can also um, expect a high throughput through I um, because of the vertical scalability that Tendermint Core provides and also fast finality. As I mentioned, we're fully EVM compatible and Web3 compatible. And we're currently on the works of implementing uh, the EIP 1559 fee standard that Ethereum is going to introduce in the next few weeks um, or in the next few days. Um, um, so that users can expect to also define um, the max fee cap on the max tip uh, to, a, to be able to be accepted by the validators and on Ethermen. Um, so that's kind of like a cool innovation that we also plan to expand and make it available for other chains within the Cosmos ecosystem to benefit from the work that we're that we're doing. Okay, um, next. Yeah, so this is a small diagram of how we see Ethermen group um, evolving in the future. Um, we, as far as this ambition, Ethermain to be the hub for the EVM chains that are gonna spun up within the Cosmos ecosystem, and that will be able to provide liquidity and composability, not only to the users that are um, going to deploy their smart contracts on, on Ethermain's EVM, but also for other chains that will be able to interoperate with smart contracts um, written in Solidity that are deployed on the on Ethermint, uh, no matter where those users are. So for example, um, here on the top right side, we have the Atom that's representing the Cosmos Hub. So users can be can expect to interoperate um, with the smart contracts uh, in Ethermint, uh, even though the Cosmos Hub is not, is not at the moment EVM compatible. So users and modules within the Cosmos Hub could be able to be uh, to interoperate through IBC and be able to call smart contracts and benefit from the composability that we're providing to the whole ecosystem. Um, so that's one non-EVM to an EVM uh, IBC interoperability component. Then we have on the other side, the EVM to EVM interoperability. Um, so we have here the Kronos chain um, that is also gonna be EVM compatible within the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, so we can expect um, other EVM application specific blockchains. So um, zones that are deploying an EVM to, to also uh, enhance its capabilities, uh, targeting a specific use case can also connect to other EVM chains and smart contracts within the ecosystem through IVC. So a smart contracts on the Ethermint chain could interact easily with a smart contract that it's deployed on the Kronos chain and still access to liquidity and make ERC20 token transfer or NFT token transfer um, um, to other EVM chains. Um, uh, the third one here is Terra. Um, Terra on the left um, bottom uh, side of this slide uh, uses uh, Cosmo Wasm as its VM execution for reading smart con for for composability in uh, like smart contracts written in Rust um, and sorry in Wasm. So. We're planning on um, introducing additional capabilities to IBC that will ena enable users um, to be able to call smart contracts that are not necessarily written on an EVM as well. So making cross-chain contract calls and cross-chain value transfer between smart contracts uh, written in Solidity and, on, and smart contracts that might be written in, in WASM that are deployed on the Cosmo WASM VM. Um, so users in Terra will also be able to access uh, liquidity from Ethermint and from other sources and be able to interoperate uh, within the within the, the boundaries and like within the possibilities that, that these features allow us. And then finally, we have Ethereum on the uh, top left side. Um, so for Ethereum, how we're uh, enabling interoperability with Ethereum is through a bridge. Um, so this bridge is gonna be the gravity bridge. Um, and we're also planning on support, like because we're gonna be EVM compatible, we can also easily support like other um, other bridges that are um, 
that have different security guarantees that are um, that bridge different EVM chains, um, so that users can also uh, create ERC token transfers between um, the Ethereum mainnet and um, and the Ethereum chain. Um, so those tokens can either be represented as um, Cosmos coins, like the Atom uh, has this, the, the Cosmos coin uh, token standard. Um, well, it's not a standard, but, um, or there's also the ERC20 token format. So users, uh, users that are transferring value from Ethereum can choose whether if they wanna express those tokens as, cos as, as a Cosmos coin representation or as an e ERC20 token the representation that can be used within the smart contracts or within the EVM um, that, that Ethermin uses. So there's four types of interoperability that we're working on and we're expanding the, so that we try to expand the capabilities and the possibilities um, from the from the existing uh, IVC applications to greater benefit the whole Cosmos and the EVM ecosystem out there. I want to um, topic the question from Charles Patterson. Uh, can I use my ERC20 soon on Ethermin? Yeah, um, so that's a really good question. So, um, so the ERC20 tokens that you might hold on Ethereum will be um, will be interoperable with, uh, the can interoperate with Ethermint, um, as I mentioned, as a Cosmos coin or as an ERC-20. Um, most likely we're gonna deploy only the, the, the Cosmos coin format initially, and then we're gonna expand to support ERC-20 tokens within the Ethermint chain uh, that can be relayed and, and be able to be um, transferred between the EVMs in Ethereum and Ethermint. So basically you're saying if there is a DEX on Ethermint, then I would be able to directly use my ERC-20s. Yeah, that yeah. so if, if it's able to connect uh, through the gravity bridge and emit tokens that the relayer and the value orchestrat orchestrators can make sense of, then those mm -hmm. events can be relayed to Ethereum and thus communicate with tokens um, and with smart contracts in Ethereum. Cool. Shall I go to the next slide? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, it's Amy. Great, because I have some questions. <laughs> um, so my first question is, um, can I deploy a smart contract on Ethermint? Yeah, you can deploy a smart contract using the standard Ethereum tooling, uh, and, and then use Remix and, and use your MetaMask wallet in, in the same way that you would expect to use it on Ethereum. Um, the, uh, and, and yeah, like basically be able to inspect your code and interact with your core code using the um, existing, like um, this existing Ethereum tooling that can, that can be able to help you with that as well. So there's no assumption about addresses, for example, like any of this stuff. Assumption about addresses? Can you like expand if on that? I, if I'm deploying a contract on Ethermint, is it going to look like an Ethereum address? Yes, uh, so they all have the same um, hex format as Ethereum uses. So, and because we're Web3 compatible and because we implement the JSON RPC server on top of Cosmos, um, users can deploy their smart contracts and inspect the, their Ethereum addresses in the same format that they would use in Ethereum. Okay. And then, so if I have an existing smart contract set up, like let's say I'm running Uniswap, on Ether, on Ethereum, I would yeah. be able to, um, would I have to recreate, like redeploy those contracts onto Ethermint or, yeah. What, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can deploy it in, in, the, in the same fashion using Truffle or using Hard Hat or any other tooling of the, the, that you prefer, or you can use, even use the command line as well to deploy your, um, your ERC-20 token contracts or any smart contract that you like on Ethermint. 
So if the addresses are also, also hex format on Ethermint, how do I know if I'm interacting with the Ethermint smart contract or Ethereum one? Um, so this is a great question. It all comes to the um, coin type on the HD path that both provide. Um, currently we're using the same coin type. So the same addresses on Ethereum are, are this, um, if you have an address on Ethereum, you can use it on Ethermint. Um, but we're currently seeing some um, issues with the ledger address. So if we if we keep that standard, we won't be able to use a custom ledger address. So we're like um, so we're um, looking for other options there. Either change the coin type, um, and then it's easily um, you can easily change that as well on on, on MetaMask. Um, but yeah, we want to be like full fully compatible with um, the existing Cosmos and Ethereum tooling. So that's why we're like figuring out um, like a potential solution there. And how do you prevent collision of addresses between the two chains? Um, so yeah, uh, collision of addresses um, in in the sense of like, oh, if you have a uh, an address on Ethereum and then you have the same one on Ethermint. Um, yeah, so then you can, um, they're currently colliding in the sense that you are able to use the same mnemonic to to make IVC transfers. Um, but as I mentioned, there's like some security guarantees that the ledger device provide on other ones as well. So for example, other projects in the EVM space use the same coin type as Ethereum. Um, so we're trying to figure out what's the best way to move forward uh, with regard to address collision and address usage. Cool. Um, Neil asks, will Ethermint have its own Ledger Nano device app? Um, we're currently discussing that, but in my sound, that will be the case. Um, so in order to support like Ethereum formatted transactions and Ethereum formatted address as well. So the users can choose whether to display their addresses in Brick32 format. So in the same way that um, currently Cosmos Hub uses or in the hex format that Ethereum uses. Great. Um... Or Trezor. Are there any plans to interoperate with something like Trezor? Um, as far as I know, there's no Trezor support for Cosmos. So we'll have to check that. Um, Ethereum supports it. Um, I have another question. So when, when is the estimated launch date of Ethereum? We're trying to aim for Q4 this year. Um, most likely going to launch with a fully compatible EVM chain and then eventually like introduce more of the uh, IVC components later down the road. Um, and um, we might introduce a few other functionalities that will benefit users besides just EVM support. Um, so we're aiming for Q4 this year. Um, so around that time. What are some of the benefits and are there any disadvantages to having an EVM in the in the technical infrastructure? Yeah, so there are a bunch of challenges. Um, they're mostly related to the um, compatibility with Ethereum and on what Ethereum expects. So for example, when you submit a transaction or a state transition on Ethereum, um, Ethereum state machine or like Ethereum state keeps track of uh, dirty objects. Uh, so objects that have been modified within the same uh, within the same period or the same block in this case. Uh, whereas there's no concept of dirty objects in Tendermint. So we had to get around that. And there's also like the formatting of the types specifically for the blocks and the transactions. So for example, Tendermint has a given trans, uh, header and block type um, that it's very different from the one uh, that the JSON RPC um, service provides. So we had to do some 
parsing or an additional like computing um, functionality in order to like fully display um, the information that we have in a way that it's understandable by all the existing Ethereum tooling. So there are no um, so there are no effects for like gas prices that you pay. No, there are no effects on gas gas prices. You define your gas in the same way um, on the transaction, and then you also define the gas price. Um, as I mentioned before, we're also introducing EIP fifteen fifty nine, so the users will be able to define the the um, the max tip and the max fee cap on the transaction. Mm -hmm. So. From the audience. Um, okay. Um, I'm not sure if there's no other questions, then potentially we could wrap this one up a little bit earlier. Um, again, Fede is available on Twitter. Um, Thursis Finance, F E concept, <laughs> second cup of coffee. Um, and I, oh, okay. Neil wants to ask if you can give a sneak peek on Ethermint's token supply. Will it be as Ethers? Um, that's a great question. We're currently figuring that out as well as the initial token distribution. Um, we'll be announcing that on our official channel. So if you follow us on Twitter, Tharsis Finance will we'll, um, be announcing everything regarding like the token distribution, the token supply, and also the the upcoming ERDA for Atom holders that help us bootstrap our engineering team through the governance proposal. Great, looking forward to that also. <laughs> Thank you. Um, cool, yeah, feel free to, uh, feel free to, um, reach out to either Fede or myself. Um, I'm not as available on Twitter as Fede, unfortunately. I don't really use social media as much, but um, we will definitely schedule a next call. Um, if there are any pressing questions or things that you feel like you particularly want clarified as a topic for the next call, then please feel free to reach out as well. Um, and we will definitely take those into priority. So thank you all for being here and yeah, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie.